I've been looking for ways to speed up my workflow as a composer and producer for the past 10 years, and I think I found the best way to do so with the tool you probably already have lying around. Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm a little bit of a control freak. Sorry for the pun. Seriously though, my desk is covered with controllers, just look at it. And these controllers substitute pointing, clicking, and dragging my mouse around with a much faster and a more efficient way of working, IMO. Recently, I've been getting a lot of questions on my Instagram posts regarding the touchscreen that is on my desk, so I decided to do a little overview video on what's going on here. Now, this is not an in-depth tutorial on how to actually make this, I can definitely make one of those videos, just let me know in the comments below. So, there are a lot of composers out there that are using touchscreens, like Hans Zimmer, Junkie XL, the list goes on. And most of them use custom-built, custom-coded touchscreens that, sadly, we mortals cannot get. But there are plenty of solutions out there that can help you achieve virtually the same effect. So here's the method that is working for me. I am using a first-generation 12.9-inch iPad Pro that is sitting on an overpriced charging base by Logitech that just has the right viewing angle for me, since I'm using the Avid Artist Mix. And as a nice little benefit, it charges the iPad through its smart connector, so I don't have any cables hanging from the side. Now, you're probably thinking, I don't have an iPad just lying around. Well, you don't have to. You can use your phone as your touchscreen. And yes, the screen might seem a little small, but as you'll see in a minute, you're not really limited by your screen size. And if you need anything bigger, any Android tablet is gonna get the job done. And you can get a decent 10-inch Android tablet for as low as $85 off of Amazon. So the app that I'm using is called Lemur. And yes, it's the most expensive one out there at $24, but I've tried other apps like Metagrid and TouchOSC, and I found that Lemur really resembles the look and feel of the touchscreens that Hans and Junkie Excel use. And that was really important to me when creating this whole system. I really wanted it to look and feel like the touchscreens that the pros use, and it had to be clear and intuitive, otherwise it kind of defeats the purpose of having a touchscreen. So, step one of making this happen is trying to figure out how to manage your screen real estate. This is where the 12.9-inch screen of the iPad really comes in handy. For me, since I usually have my hands near the bottom of the screen, moving faders and knobs around, I wanted to have my most used shortcuts at the bottom of the screen. A quick caveat before we dive any deeper, I am using Cubase 10, so not everything is going to be relevant to you, especially if you're using other DAWs, but I hope this gives you an idea of what can be achieved using this and how to implement some of these ideas in your DAW. So on the bottom left, I have shortcuts for adding new tracks, so VST instrument, audio, MIDI, and even creating group track, VCA track, and effects track. So if I hit the audio button, I'm prompted with the right shortcut, same goes for MIDI. Um, say I want to add this track to a new group track, I can do that super quick, super intuitive. In the middle of the screen, I have shortcuts for moving tracks to a new folder, opening the color panel, which has a cool little feature that I'll show you in a little bit. And then I have some other functions that I like to do on the fly, like um, read and write automation, open lanes, which is a Cubase thing, etc. On the bottom right, I have shortcuts to open windows inside of Cubase. So the media bay, sync menu, mixer, and a video, um, they all work. I don't use them that much. I find that using the F keys is much faster for me, but it can't hurt to have them there. On the top left of the screen, I have shortcuts to control MIDI editing functions, which I do a lot. But these are almost exclusively a Cubase feature thing that we won't get into in this video. But if you are a Cubase user, you can pause the video right now and kind of figure out what each of the functions do. Finally, this main window is actually a tabbed window, which means it can have multiple tabs, much like you would in your internet browser. And each tab can have a completely different set of buttons, faders, shortcuts, whatever you want. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be this window. You can essentially have the entire screen as a tabbed window or have multiple tabbed windows across your screen. To me, I figured what I wanted to be stationary and I use all the time and then have one window that is more dynamic depending on what I was doing at that moment. So the two buttons on the bottom left actually switch between the two tabs, main and visibility. Now, creating these buttons to switch between tabs does require some very simple coding. Trust me, if I was able to figure it out, 
it is easy. But nonetheless, you can avoid coding and scripting these buttons if you don't mind having a tab bar at the top of this window. So, in the main window, I have all of my quantized divisions plus a triplet button, which is super useful, um, an audio warp toggle, which is a Cubase exclusive function, a quick quantize button, and opening the quantize panel. In the middle section, I have some random shortcuts that I seldom use just because I'm already used to the shortcuts on my keyboard. I do, however, use these purple shortcuts quite a bit to individually see my velocity, modulation, expression, sustain, pitch band, aftertouch lanes inside of a MIDI track, and then I have one button to show them all together. Super useful. This group on the bottom right of the main window is kind of known to be stolen directly from Hans Zimmer's touchscreen. It selects MIDI notes by velocity range in 10-bit increments. Sounds like some unnecessary mouthful. Maybe. I think I've used it maybe twice in my life, but again, it's a big iPad. Plus, it's a tabbed window, so I'm not really short on screen space. When I did use it, it was very useful. So I programmed some random MIDI notes with a linear curve to their velocity, and as you can see, when I select each group range, it's kind of, it selects the right velocity range. Um, it is useful, I don't use it a lot, but there it is. The visibility tab is super derived from Junkie Excel videos, and again, it heavily relies on Cubase, but I can only assume other DAWs have similar functions. But in a nutshell, it is used to show certain types of tracks depending on their property. So it can show me tracks with data on the cursor point, show me strings tracks, brass, woodwinds, show me only audio, show MIDI, and show sense, and of course, show all. I mainly use these buttons when I'm composing and I have a large project. It really helps to see these specific tracks and not the entire session. So if your DAW can do this, I highly recommend taking the time to set this up. Now, my third and final tab for now is actually activated by pressing the colors button. And it is set up so that when I press it, it both opens up my color panel in Cubase and changes to my colors tab. And now I have a color panel on my iPad and whichever color I pick is automatically changed in Cubase. Fantastic. And this is it. The most useful, most intuitive way to interact with your DAW and streamline your workflow. Or so I thought. Since I started making this video, I became even more obsessed with making my workflow as fast as I possibly can, and I found a way that just blew my mind when I got it to work. I found out that using Keyboard Maestro for my Mac, I can control Cubase menu items, key commands, Windows Focus, and even create conditions using If This Then That protocol to create a string of macros that is just not possible with the built-in shortcuts in Cubase. So with a single push of a button, I can have Cubase add a new instrument track, choose the right VST instrument, name the track, and color it. Or even create a new audio track, set it to stereo, select the right input channel for my camper for example, name it GTR, and select my default guitar track color. Still not impressed? Check out this macro I configured for recording backing vocals. Before executing the macro, Keyboard Maestro will ask me for the number of tracks I want to create. Then using the data I input, it will create the right number of tracks, not before making sure they're set to mono, have the right input channel, and naming them bvox1 through number of tracks. Then it will go track by track, penning them left and right, alternating between each track. Then it will select all of the tracks and route them to a new bus, or basically creating a new group track in Cubase, not before making sure that one is set to stereo and naming it bvox. Then it will select all of the tracks again, including the new group track, color it pink, and then select the first Bvox track so I'm ready to record. All under 8 seconds, all with a single push of a button. Ready? Check it out. So here we are in Cubase. Let's do 20 tracks. Amazing! And they're all panned correctly, all mono, named right. I can't stress enough how time-saving this is. Plus, having Keyboard Maestro do all of these commands for me and way faster than I could frees my mind to stay creative rather than interact with the software. Now, yes, Keyboard Maestro costs $36, and setting it up this way is way more intricate and requires a lot more time and trial and error to actually get it to work, but just think of the time you'll be saving. For me, I think it's worth it. 
And because Keyboard Maestro is such a complex piece of software, you can trigger its macros from pretty much anywhere. Your touchscreen, uh, secondary keyboard, or the Stream Deck in my situation where I have custom labeled keys for each function. Or if you really want to take it to the next level, imagine the next time you're tuning your guitar saying, Echo, trigger new guitar track. So I hope you found this video useful. Please let me know what you think. Um, let me know in the comments below if you want me to make the longer video where I explain how to actually make this work. I would love to make this video for you. Please like and subscribe because apparently that's what people want these days. And stay creative, stay awesome. I'll see you in the next one.